I want you to turn with me in your Bible to uh, several scriptures. In fact, if you don't get a chance to turn to them, that'll be okay. I'm going to read them. I'm going to read out of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read out of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. As you know, we've been studying the last two Sundays on war, uh, on spiritual warfare. Is it real? And uh, today we're talking about war in the heavenlies. The war that's going on in the heavenlies. And so the foundation scripture for the warfare that we're doing, the warfare that's going on is Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to read that to you. I know you've read it. You say, I know this. I've read this so many times. And you know what? I have too. But I need to remind myself over and over again because sometimes we forget. It says in Hebrews, you need to pay the more earnest heed to the things that you've learned, lest at any time you should let them slip. And I don't know about you, sometimes my clutch slips a little bit. And so I need to relearn some things or rehear some things that I've already learned and put them back into practice in my life. So Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he starts it off with finally. <clears throat> if I started the message off today with finally, you'd say, oh boy, this is going to be a short message. Because finally means you're wrapping things up, doesn't it? Well, Paul's wrapping things up here for the church uh, at Ephesus, the letter that he wrote them. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He gives us the source of our strength. And then he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand, not fall. You may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes or the tricks of the devil. For we do not wrestle, and keep reading there. Because some like to stop right there and say, well, we don't wrestle. We do not wrestle against each other. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we do wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And literally that word heavenly places just means in the heavenlies. So there's a war going on in the heavenlies. You say, well, if it's going on in the heavenlies, that means it doesn't affect me. Wrong. Going on in the heavenlies doesn't mean it's in heaven where God is. If you remember, Paul wrote one time, he said, I was caught up into the third heaven. The Bible speaks of three heavens. The third heaven is the abode of God. There's not warfare going on up there. The second heaven is the universe. They're all out there in the universe. The first heaven is the atmosphere that we live in on this earth. That's where the war is going on in the heavenlies. In the heavenlies around where we're living, there's a warfare going on. If our spiritual eyes would be open, we would see that the atmosphere is charged with both good and evil angels. Holy angels and demonic spirits. And there's a war going on in the heavenlies. And that war is going on against human beings. Against the people of God. Against the people that God loves. Christians and non-Christians alike. So that war is going on, and the Bible says that we are warring against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places, or in the heavenlies. Now, Timothy wrote, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul wrote, Timothy, excuse me, said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold to eternal truth, to which you were also called and have confessed, the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What did Paul say there? Fight the good fight of faith. So, you know, I grew up in the day when everybody said, let's just all peace out, brother. Everybody love one another. You know, love, love, love. That's all we need, just a little more love. Let's just love one another. You know what? We do supposed to love one another, but we also have to fight. And the fight is not for ourselves, amongst ourselves, and with ourselves. The fight is against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. There's a warfare going in the heavenlies, and you are part of the spoil of that warfare. Jesus spent so much of his time, we talked about, dealing with demons, demonic principles, teaching on spiritual warfare, healing those who were oppressed of the devil. And so Paul writes, says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, growing up, sometimes as a kid, you get in little scuffles. But parents call them fights, and they spank you for doing that. And, you know, you get troubles for fighting, but... I never fought a good fight that I lost. It wasn't a good fight unless I won. And I was the kind that I wanted to win at any price. So if I had to pick up a bigger stick, I'd pick up a bigger stick. But I don't like to lose. I sure don't like to lose a fight. And so when Paul said, fight the good fight of faith, he's saying fight the winning fight. 
Fight the fight that's going to win because the good fight of faith is a winning fight. And we're supposed to be winners in case you wondered about that. We are winners. And he said, fight the good fight of faith. Then the next thing he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he said, I have fought the good fight. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. At the end of time for each one of us, and by the way, did you know that every second that goes by, you're getting closer to the end of your time? I mean, I, I, we, we don't think about time that much sometimes, but just this morning, I put my coffee in the microwave for the third time. And I hit 30 seconds, and I was sitting there watching the 30 seconds, waiting for it to hurry up so I can get my coffee out and I'll be hot. And I was sitting there thinking, and I was watching it time down. I thought, my life is ticking away. I just spent 30 seconds of my life. I invested in this cup of coffee. It was worth it. <laughs> I'm not begrudging it, but, you know, you think we push a little button on a microwave and the timer starts going down. We think, well, you know, that's just time. But time is our life. And so at the end of our lives, I want us to be able to say, because we're here in this together, all of us together, I want us to be able to say, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course. I kept the faith. I want us to know at the end that we've done our due damage to the powers of darkness, that we did what we were supposed to do, that we discouraged the kingdom of darkness, we defeated the kingdom of darkness, because Jesus Christ has given us the authority to win in this life. And to share his kingdom and to go forth in his power and his authority and his anointing and to distribute the, the grace of God throughout the kingdom, throughout the world and establish the kingdom of God. Father, we ask you now to open our eyes to your word. We know that spiritual eyes are different than natural eyes. And so we can see naturally what your word says, but let us see spiritually. Let it take root in our hearts and grow and produce much fruit in our lives. We pray right now, Father God, for eyes to see and ears to hear. We agree together. We bind those powers of darkness to try to deceive, to confuse, to create anger, to create distractions in the name of Jesus. We do our due diligence in standing in the word of God, by the word of God, based on the uh, Shed blood of Jesus Christ in the authority given to us. We give you praise and glory for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you've heard and happened to see the first two messages we've done in this series, you know we're talking about a real dynamic and continual battle. You know it's real. If you haven't seen them, they are online. You can go look at them at our website. I encourage you to do so because every one of these, though they stand alone, they also fit together. And what Don's going to do next week is going to tie this all thing together even more. And then the following week, we're going to have a kind of a rehearsal, a reversal, and a renewal and go back over all the things that we've gone over. But uh, we're going to recap it. There's a lot that has been said. A lot has been done. But we want to walk right now in, in, in the ways that, that will lead us to victory. The first message we talked about was the fact that spiritual warfare, is it real? And I think we finally got over the point and everybody agrees that spiritual warfare is real. Now, I, a lot of people will not agree with you on that. A lot of people will say, oh, no, it's just a, there's just a force of evil out there. You don't have to worry about it. There's just, a, you know, because there's evil in the world. Well, no, there's not just evil in the world. There are evil spirits in this world and they're creating havoc and causing evil. So there are literally spirits that are causing havoc and evil in our world today. The second message was, is, is it for me? Wait, do I need to get involved in that spiritual warfare? Do I need to do anything about this spiritual warfare thing? And I will say to you a resounding yes, you do. You do. You cannot ignore. You can't say, King's X, I'm not going to play in this game. I want to sit on the sidelines. There is no sideline. God is love and loves you. Satan is hate and hates you, and he's coming after you with everything that he has. And in reviewing just a little bit, two questions that we, we, we need to ask ourselves. One is, what do I need to do to be set free? We touched on this last week. I want to just reiterate it. What do I need to do to be set free? And secondly, what do I need to do to continue to walk in the freedom that Jesus died to give me? There's one thing to be set free. It's another thing to stay free. You can be set free today, and be back in bondage tomorrow. So we don't want to just get set free. We want to learn to stay free. Too often I see people get set free and then before long they're back in bondage again. Why do you get back in bondage? Because if you keep doing the same things you've been doing, you're going to get the same results. You can't stay free going back to the same old demonic darkness that you went through before. 
We've got to learn to stay free. So what do we need to do to, to be set free and to stay free? The first thing is we need to accept that demons do exist and that they are your mortal enemy. Acknowledge it. Accept it. Don't try to hide from it. Just say, I know you're there. You don't, you don't scare me. I know who you are, but I know who I am. Because the Bible says, I am in Christ Jesus. And if I'm in Christ, if I'm in Christ, then when they come in contact with me, they're coming in contact with Christ. And you know what that does? That scares the life out of them. It scares the devil out of them. Oh, no, I can't do that, can I? Because they are devils. <laughs> it scares them literally. Because Jesus Christ is the king of all kings, and they know they have no power, no authority against him. So if I'm in Christ Jesus, I need to accept the fact that when I walk into a room, if I'm walking in Christ, that I walk in a room, Jesus walks in, and the demons tremble. Secondly, we need to admit that we have a problem. We did a Celebrate Recovery one time around here. One of the things they start off with is to know this. Denial is not a river in Egypt. We need to acknowledge we've got trouble. I have a problem. I can't get over this. I pray and I seek and it just keeps binding me. I'm trying to get closer to God and it seems like I can get so far and then it just jerks me back. I don't understand why I can't really get close to God. There's something hindering me. I've got this habit. I've got this attitude. I've got this, this way about me. I can't seem to break free from it. And what's the keeping me? It's keeping me from enjoying the, my life. Those are all indications that you've got spiritual entities clinging to you, hanging on you, possessing you, oppressing you, depressing you, suppressing anything you want because they're bothering you, right? So you need to admit that you've got a problem. Oh, I don't have a problem. It's like when people, they think they're speaking faith words when they've got 104 degrees temperature, their nose is run, their eyes are swelled up, and they're aching in every joint of the body, and they say, oh, no, I'm not sick. I'm not going to confess I'm sick. Look, faith is not believing a lie or saying a lie. That's just a plain lie. You're sick. Faith says, I may be sick, but I am healed right now in the name of Jesus and begin to confess healing. To, to admit you have a problem, is that, that's one of the things the devil has done. He's taken the scripture and twisted it and made us think that if we admit something, that we're giving into it. We will never do battle if we don't admit we've got a problem. Thirdly, acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Yes, he is. There is no other Lord. He's the one Lord, the only God. He is above all gods. There is no other God above him. And he can do all things, and you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Admit that you know that fellow. That he lives inside of you, and you're living on his strength. By you're living by the faith of the Son of God. Admit that you have a problem. Acknowledge Jesus is Lord has accomplished all that you need. Nothing else needs to be done. You never need to say, God, I ask you to bind the devil. He says, I've already done that, and I've given you authority to keep him bound. We read in Matthew last week, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. You've got authority to bind and to loose. So if you've got something coming against you, bind it. If you've got something hanging on you, loose it. Command it to go. Acknowledge that Jesus has already done all needed for your deliverance and for your freedom. You say, well, I did that one time. There is a need for daily cleansing. I mean, you got up this morning, you washed your hands, you washed, maybe even took a shower today, maybe you took it last night, but anyway. And so if you went outside and you fed the dogs and you scratched the cat and you did all these things, you come in the house, you probably, before you eat lunch, you're going to probably, anyway you should, let me just encourage you, go ahead and do it anyway. You're probably going to wash your hands. You don't need to take another bath. You just need to wash your hands. Why? Because our hands get defiled. Our feet sometimes get defiled. You know, we don't want anybody touching our feet. We haven't washed our feet already. So Jesus addressed this with his disciples when he was going to wash Peter's feet. And Peter said, Jesus, don't wash my feet. You, I don't, he said, if I don't wash your feet, I've got nothing to do with you. He said, well, wash me all over then. If that's the case, and Jesus said, you don't need to be washed all over. You're already washed. It's just your feet get defiled. And that's a, it's an implication of warfare and, and battling of sin that goes on in our lives. We don't need to be totally rewashed. We don't got to get saved again. We just need daily washing, daily cleansing. At the end of the day, you need to just have a, a soul cleansing, maybe during the day. So you don't need to have your whole body washed again, but you do need daily cleansing. And here's a little, little simple thing we talked about last week, but I want to go over it with you again. A step to just personal deliverance or corporate deliverance. 
First of all, detect. You need to detect any present, any ground given, or any place given to the devil. Detect those things. Secondly, disarm. What we do, we pull down strongholds, the Bible says. Cast down imagination, high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. How do we do that? Speak it. Speak it. The Bible says you'll have what you say you have. So what do I do? I need to speak. Right now, I, I detect that I have uh, 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 unclean. I feel something. I don't it's not right. I detect that. And so right now, I want to know that by authority of the word of God, I disarm every principality, every power, every ruler of darkness. I cast down imaginations and everything exalts them against the knowledge of God. I pull down strongholds in my life. You will not have a place in my life, devil, because the Bible says give no place to the devil. So you disarm them. And this is where some people have a problem. We like to make pets out of demons. Well, I just enjoy that. I, I kind of enjoy that little deal. I know it's not really good for them, but we, we, I, it's like Pharaoh. I want to sleep one more night with the frogs. I want to stay one more. I, I, we kind of have, I kind of got that under control. Nobody really knows about it. So I, I don't want, I, I kind of want to keep that as a pet. I'll keep it on a leash, a short leash. No, disown. Disown. Reject. I reject that in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I've done it 10 times already. Do it the 11th time. How many times do you want to disown? As many times as you feel like you've owned. As many times as you need to. Disown, that means I don't want anything to do with you. You know what it means for some, some parents say, well, I disown my children. It means they don't have anything for me anymore. I've disowned them. Disown those spirits. Reject Satan and his demons for Jesus Christ. Then dismiss them. Man, that gives you some authority. You know, you see somebody sitting in, you know, you see there, you're watching uh, Frank on Blue Blood. And he's sitting there and he said, you're dismissed. Get out of my office. Go on. Dismiss. That's what you do. That gives you, that gives you a sense of power and authority. Say, I want nothing to do with you. I dismiss you. Go. We think it's a big deal, but it's not a big deal. It's just simply saying, you know what? I've disowned you. Now I dismiss you. You leave. I dismiss you to the abyss. I like to say it the way. Dismiss to the abyss. You have authority to do that. And then fifth, determine right then, maybe for the fifth time, sixth time, the hundredth time, determine I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I love to quote Joshua chapter 24, I believe verse 15. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. This house is going to serve the Lord. I'm going to go with Jesus Christ. So, I want to reiterate this point to you because we talked about it just a little bit, but I want you to know. People say, I'm tired of the battle. I want to just quit. I want to let down. Do you get battle weary sometimes? Be honest. Yeah, we get battle weary. Sometimes we say, man, I just got this one thing taken here, some five more. I don't know, I'm tired of the battle. When can I just quit? When can I lay back? and rest when can i stop struggling when can i stop fighting these battles i'm tired of this constant battle when can i i'll tell you when when we all get to heaven that's when you cannot stop the battle till you get to heaven we're in the battleground right now i've made the statement last week write this down remember this the earth is not a playground it's a battleground and as long as you're alive on this earth you're going to be in a battle that just means you get more opportunities to win more opportunities to have victory in your life. You're going to have battles, so every battle is a victory. We love to go to football games, a basketball game thing, because it gives us opportunity to have a victory. We don't always have them, but it doesn't mean we don't go back to the next one. I may get beat today or tomorrow, but I'm going to get up the next day, and I'm going to go fight a battle, and I'm going to win eventually because I'm not giving up because I know who the victor is. See, I don't have the victory. I have the victor. That's a big difference. Our battles here will never cease. The enemy will wear you down. I was just kind of praying over the, yesterday and thinking about some illustrations. And, you know, the, it seems like the enemy is just constantly pulling, 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 trying to get you to go, trying to pull you over here. And, and I had this little vision of something I've seen many, many times, a robin. Robins, when they come in the spring, and out my house, we've got tons of earthworms. And those robins, they will run there, and they will grab hold of one, and they'll yank and yank and yank. And they've got a little trick, because those earthworms can help make themselves swell up in a hole, and they can't get them out. They'll break them off. they keep pulling. So what the robin does for a little while, he does what? He just releases a little bit. 
When he releases the earthworm, relax it. He jerks him out before he knows he's caught. And that's what the devil tries to do to you. He tries to pull and pull, and you get in, and you know, finally he, re, he may release the pressure for a little while. We, we don't always live under pressure, but beware when the pressure is released, you're about to get jerked. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to bring bad news to you, but I'm just telling you the truth. The Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. And when, when the pressure is not on you and you relax and get ready, you're going to get jerked. If you're not prepared, you'll get gobbled up. Well, I'm not going through battles. Well, you better get ready because the Bible says in this world you'll have tribulation. You're going to have battles. It's up to us as believers to get equipped. The Bible says that the fivefold ministry is given in Ephesians chapter 4, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher, for the work of equipping the saints for ministry. And part of equipping is learning how to do warfare. If you don't know how to do warfare, you're an ill-equipped Christian. And you're walking off into a battle you have no chance of winning. Doesn't mean you won't be saved when you die, but you'll go through hell on earth. You need to be equipped we need to be equipped and prepared and ready for battle. Soldiers of Jesus Christ, life and death struggle. That's what we're in for our lives, the lives of our family, the lives of our friends, the lives of our church. We need to be trained. We need to train. We need to prepare for the fight. And there is no sanctuary city. I'm sorry. There is no King's X. The only sanctuary you have is in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, rest in me. Don't rest in your laurels. Don't rest on your past victories. Don't rest on your money. Don't rest on your, on your fame and fortune. Rest in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. It doesn't mean don't have a business. It doesn't mean don't work for a living. It, does, it means don't get your life so entangled in the things of the world that you're neg negating the warfare that's going on around you. In Peter, it says, be sober and vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we're to be alert at all times, living in Jesus Christ, a good soldier, a prepared soldier, and a soldier that is ready to fight. So then we can say, as Paul said, I fought the good fight. And we can say, even today, I'm fighting the good fight. How would you characterize your life today? Are you fighting the good fight? Or are you getting the stuffings kicked out of you? Well, I'm not getting the stuffings kicked out of me, but I'm not really winning much either. I'm just kind of existing. Jesus didn't go to the cross and die so that we could exist. He didn't say in John chapter 10, I'm come that you may have life and that you may exist. He said that you may have it more abundantly. That's what he wants for us. Abundant life. Abundant living. Victory. No, you can't have victory without a fight. I'm not saying just going to go out there and everything's going to be rosy posy all the way through life. You'll never have a victory without having a, a, a battle. You've got to have a battle. So Paul said, I want to fight the good fight. I want to think about this in an analogy here. Think about a soldier. One of our soldiers, the United States, greatest protecting mechanism in the world, the greatest fighting machine in the world. That's why you're able to sit where you are today and be free because we got people who paid the ultimate price that we'd have that freedom. <laughs> Just like Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price so you could be free in him also. So you think about a soldier, what it would be like if our government decided, you know, it just costs so much. <laughs> I mean, we got to cut our budget. So we're not going to train our soldiers anymore. We're not going to discipline them. We're just going to drag them off the streets, out of the slums, wherever we can find them, pull them in here, and we're going to give them something. We're going to send them out to battle. They'd be undisciplined and untrained. Think about a soldier, undisciplined, untrained, that no knowledge of his weapons. Well, you got this thing here, but I don't know what to do with it. I've never picked one of it in my life. I'm ignorant of the enemy. Who's our enemy? Where are we going to fight? What's it going to do? We don't know anything about his weapons. We don't know anything about his tactics. We know nothing about what's going on with the enemy. We're unaware of the battle that's going on because we put a soldier out there and say, just go out there and, and just do whatever comes up. Throw him out in the middle of a battle. Unaware there's a battle going on. Unaware of the battleground. Unaware of the staging area. 
a soldier that just kind of slumbers and sleeps and rests in mediocrity and complacency. What kind of soldier would that be? Wouldn't you feel comfortable knowing that your freedom is being guarded by an army like that? Don't know what's going on, not disciplined. They're all out there, just a bunch of ragtags. Don't know how to use their weapons. Don't even know there's a battle going on. Ignorant of the battle of the warfare. You'll find that a soldier like that is a danger to himself. A soldier like that is a danger to his squad. A soldier like that is a danger to his company. A soldier like that is a, a danger to his platoon. A soldier like that is a danger to you. An army like that is a danger to us. But then again, think about us as believers, as Christians. So many Christians have no idea there's a battle even going on. So many Christians are untrained and undisciplined and don't want to get trained and don't want to get disciplined. In fact, they'll say, I don't want to know about that. I'm going to hide your head in the sand. I found that when the ostrich hides his head in the sand, he is a very good candidate for getting a rear kicking. Have you ever noticed that? If you got your head down, there's something else sticking up, and you're a good candidate for getting kicked in it. You need to be trained and disciplined. Think about a Christian who has no idea about his weapons. Weapons? I don't know what about weapons. I don't need a weapon. I'm a, I'm a peace. I'm a peacemonger. I don't want anything to do with weapons. Don't even talk to me about the battle going on. Don't talk to me about weapons. Ignorant of the enemy's weapons and tactics. Now, I don't have an enemy. There's no enemy out there. Unaware of the battleground. Don't know where the battleground is. Don't know about the staging area. Don't know how it works. A Christian who's just slumbering in mediocrity and complacency. You know what? They're a danger to themselves. They're a danger to their family. They're a danger to their church. They're a danger to anybody they're around because they're in the midst of a battle but totally unaware and so they just bring that battle wherever they go without any restraint. I think it's time for the body of Christ to arm up, don't you? I think we need to wise up. Galatians chapter 5 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And this was talking about the law and the yoke of bondage of the law. But do you know the devil is an expert in legalism? He'll get you so bound up in spiritual bondage. Over the last 40-something years, we've had a lot of experiences. We don't talk about them very much because they're not to publish, they're not to talk about, but they're just to do and go on. And, but we've had many experiences. And one experience we had, we were dealing with a person and there was an evil spirit speaking back. You know, oh, you're scaring me now. Don't get scared. Now, that's just freaking me out. That doesn't happen. It happened to Jesus. If it happens to Jesus, it'll happen to you. That spirit came out of the screen. What are you doing here, son of God? You come to torment me before time? He knew what was coming, but he knew it wasn't time yet. What are you doing here now? And this spirit was very belligerent, saying what all was going to do to us and our family. And then after it recognized our authority and that we knew he couldn't do those things, he began to try to bargain with us. You won't believe what it said. It said, if you will just leave us alone, we will build your church for you. You'll never lack for money. You'll never lack for finance. You'll never lack for anything. If you'll just leave us alone, we'll build your church. I don't want the devil building my church. <laughs> I said, oh, no. <laughs> the Bible says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. I don't want to be laboring in vain. I want the Lord to build the house so we don't need your help. <laughs> but you see, you said, oh, that wouldn't happen. What do you think the devil did himself? devil himself did to Jesus. He tried to bargain with Jesus after the fast. He tried to bargain with him. He'll try to bargain with you. He'll tell you, oh, that's not so bad. Don't worry about that. Everybody else is doing it. There's a lot of Christians doing that and getting by with it. It won't hurt you. He'll tug and tug and tug. Then he'll give you a little slack. Then once you relax, he'll jerk you right out. Jerk the chain right out from under you. Jerk your feet out from under you. In Matthew, 
It says that the master was angry and delivered him to tormentors or torturers until they should pay all that was due him. Demons torment. They torture. This was something Jesus taught about the guy who would not forgive somebody who owed him something. After he had been forgiven, he would not forgive. And so he, he was thrown in prison, delivered to the tormentors. When you have unforgiveness in your life, I'm going to tell you, you open the door to tormentors. You get permission to be tormented. Do you want that? Well, you don't understand what I've been through. I wouldn't forgive them. Well, then you're going to be tormented. Unforgiveness torments you more than does the one you have unforgiveness toward. A long time acquaintance ago used to say this. Unforgiveness does more damage to the vessel in which it is stored than upon the one in which it is poured. It'll destroy you. Other people may not even know it. The Bible says we're to be a witness to the world. A witness. A witness and a soldier. You'll never be an effective witness until you become an effective soldier. You'll never become an effective witness until you become an active soldier. Get involved in the battle going on around you. Make it your choice. You see, the church has not been building soldiers. It's been building sissies. Oh, that's not politically correct, is it? Oh, somebody's going to not like my Facebook page because I said something about a sissy. No, the church is not building sissies. We're building soldiers. We need to train sissies to be soldiers. A good soldier will fight the good fight. A good soldier will pull down strongholds. A good soldier will cast down imaginations. A good soldier will resist the devil. A good soldier will wrestle the principalities and win. In the name of Jesus, a good soldier will do all these things. And finally, somebody ought to applaud. Finally, finally. That means we're wrapping up, right? Oh, maybe you don't want, well, maybe let's, I've got plenty more. We can go for another 45 minutes here. Finally, let me give you some things, and we'll go over these again later. Like I said, I'm going to tell you, we have done enough in the last three weeks to be a whole semester of seminary study that you don't normally get in seminary but we have done in the la- we had we have had a cram course and we're not go- we're not done we're going to continue don dickerman's coming next week and the week after we'll continue to mop up after that seven ways that you can determine the need for deliverance so how do i know if i need it i talked a bit a little bit a minute ago i'm going to clear it up a little more one, you have emotional problems. And I'm not talking about you're sad sometimes. I'm not talking about you watch a Christmas movie and you cry because somebody, you know, doesn't work out for them. Or you see and they finally kiss and so it's an emotional problem. I'm just, no, no. No, I'm talking about deep, uh, real emotional problems. And emotional problems will grow and develop into the next thing, a mental problem. Mental problems, many mental problems are demonic. You say, well, how do you say that? Because Jesus said that himself. The guy had, had problems. He was up in the graveyard. He was mentally messed up. They call, I'm sure they must call him the old crazy man out in the graveyard. Even speech problems. How you say it, but also what you say. I just can't control my tongue. That's expected of most people, but it's not right. I just blurt out these bad words. I can't help it. I, I've been grew up doing it, and you know I've, I'm around all the time. So I just, I, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it's coming out, it must be in there somewhere, huh? Sexual problems. Sexual problems are indication that there may be demonic spirits involved. Addictions. Physical infirmities. Huh? I thought that was just a sickness. There are a lot of physical infirmities that Jesus healed people of. Blindness. The young boy that the disciples couldn't cast the spirits out of who had some kind of physical problem that he'd get close to a fire and it would take him, throw him in the fire, get close to the lake, throw him in the lake. It had some kind of a problem with seizures and things. Physical infirmities. Another thing, religious error. There are a lot of people in religious error, which means they've given themselves over to spiritual darkness. And they'll have the Bible along with what they think. 
or what they believe. Well, I know, and they'll say things like this. Well, I know the Bible says this, but I believe that this. You know what? It doesn't matter what you believe. The Bible is the final word on every final word. God said it. It settles. You believe it or not, and if you do believe it, you get the benefits. If you don't believe it, you suffer the consequences. I found that many people who say they, are, they don't believe the Bible or say they don't believe in God have a emotional or a other problem rather than a spiritual problem. They just don't want to give in to God. So it's easier to deny God than it is to submit to the truth of the Word of God. Let me give you some steps to maintaining deliverance. One, honesty. You'll never get free hiding. You'll never get free not admitting in denial. Secondly, humility. God doesn't owe you anything. For us to go in there and say, I, well, I'm so-and-so, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good person. I do this, and I've done that, and I do that. I have a right to be free. No, you don't. The only right you had to be free is because the Son of God died so you might have freedom. For by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves as a gift of God. By grace you're saved through faith. And then the Bible says, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord so also walk in him. Every day's walking is by grace through faith. Repentance. If you want deliverance, you must have repentance. Not just say, well, I'm sorry I did that. Repentance means I'm not only sorry, I turn away from it. I refuse it. I don't want it in my life anymore. I repent of that, and I want to stay away from it. Renunciation goes right along with repentance. I renounce that in the name of Jesus as sin. I renounce it. It means I don't want anything to do with it. I renounce it. And the biggie, forgiveness. You got to have forgiveness. You say, well, how do I know if I need to forgive somebody? Surely there's somebody. If you don't know of somebody you need to forgive and the Holy Spirit doesn't bring it up, don't go searching for it. See, the devil will try to get you trapped on either side of the road. He'll try, first of all, to get you not to give forgiveness. So you, they don't deserve your forgiveness, so just keep them, keep them in bondage. Don't, don't do that. When in reality, you're the ones in bondage, not them. Then the other hand, he'll say, well, surely you must. He'll put you guilty if you have forgiven everybody. He'll make you guilty because he can say, there's surely there's somebody that you've got to forgive. And we've had people say, well, I know there must be somebody I need to forgive. If you don't know who it is, then forget it. I mean, don't, you can, don't be guilty because you don't feel condemnation because the Holy Spirit doesn't give condemnation. He gives conviction. And if you're not convicted about something, then enjoy the freedom that Jesus has given you. Yeah. Prayer, deliverance, pray. God, there's the, there's the deliverance prayer. And it goes just something simple. Father, I submit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've confessed my sin. I declare Jesus my Savior, my Lord. I desire him to have total control. He purchased his body. It's not mine, it's his. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill this body. I right now and go through those things. I renounce, I reject, I stand against those things. And I ask you, Father, now to set me free. And I demand those powers of darkness. And then you start in the warfare part, the last part, warfare. I command you powers of darkness that have come against me. I command you right now, loose me, leave me alone. You have no place in me. You're an intruder. You're a trespasser. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just reiterate all that again. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not my own. I'm his. And you don't have a right to be here. So legally, I take authority over you. I cancel any permission I've ever given you. I take authority over you. I command you right now to leave me and go to the abyss in Jesus' name. And I love, I, I, I didn't know this until we visited with Don Dickerman a couple of times. I love what he does, something I never thought of. You know what he does? He says, oh, wait a minute, before you go, if you messed anything up in my life, clean it up before you leave. If you can make the mess, you can clean the mess up. So if you've destroyed, if you've hurt my organs, if you've just hurt my lungs, if you've hurt my circulatory system, if you've done any damage, you straighten that up before you leave right now. I command it in the name of Jesus. It's just declaring liberty and freedom and healing. You heal. You see, if a demon can mess it up, he can also fix it back up. He said he found that illustration when he walked by his boy's room one time, and the room was a total mess. He walked around, he looked at that room, and said, boys, y'all clean that mess up. And they said, we don't want to clean it up. He said, you made the mess, you cleaned it up. 
He said, just clicked in his spirit. If they make the mess, they can clean it up. So maybe you need to say, hey, you need to clean some of this mess up in my life. Physical elements that you've had, mental elements, things are going on. Say, hey, before you go, you fix this mess. Remember, you do have authority. You have power and authority. We haven't talked much about that, but it's there. How do we maintain our deliverance? Real quickly, real quickly. Focus your attention on Jesus Christ, obviously. Allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your life. Every day you wake up and you say, I thank you, Jesus Christ, that I'm yours. I was bought with a price. I ask you to fill me with your spirit. Holy Spirit, guide me, direct me. Have your way in my life. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it means you're controlled by the Spirit. Thirdly, immerse yourself in the Word of God. Read the Bible. You say, well, where do I read? Wherever. Find a place and start reading. Sometimes just read, just read chapters. Sometimes do studies. But get the Word of God in you. Why? Because it's the Word of God that is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the Word of God is the sword of our spirit. It is the sword that we use in, in an offensive assault against the enemy. Let me tell you, you don't sit back and play defense and all the time. You keep keeping backed up, backed up. You have to go on offense once in a while. And I believe as believers we need to be standing steadily on offense. Take the offensive. David didn't sit and wait for Goliath to come to him. He took off running to Goliath. I bet Goliath thought, what does this little pipsqueak think he's doing? I have to admire his courage. When we go running at the powers of darkness, they know. When they see that us coming, they say, oh, that's Jesus Christ coming. We better get out of here. The Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord, resist the devil. What will he do? He'll flee from you. did not say we're supposed to flee from him. Daily command the devil and his demons to leave you alone. Daily. That's that part of that cleansing. At the end of the day, do a little refreshing, do a little cleansing, do a little resubmitting, do a little, I take back any permission, little Ephesians 4.27 I take back any place I gave the enemy today. I reclaim that ground by the authority given to me in the Lord Jesus Christ. I command you to loose me, leave me, and go to the abyss. You know, they'll get to the point where when, and we don't have time to go into all this, that there's rulers, principalities, powers, rulers. There's a, an organized system like generals and corporals and lieutenants and, I mean, colonels, lieutenants, you know, all the way down to buck private. Those little buck private demons, they just got to go where they're told to go. And they're going to get to say, don't, please don't make me go to them. They're going to send me to the abyss tonight. I know what's going to happen. Please don't make me go to them. You'll have the demons fighting to stay away from you instead of fighting to come to you. Daily, command the devil and demons to leave in Jesus' name. Now, this is very important, and many people take this for granted. Many people neglect this, and many people are hurting because of this. Connect, connect, connect with a local church. Get involved. Find Christian friends. Get them around you. Live with them. Breathe with them. Have them. Go there. Get equipped by them. Connect. The local church is not an option. You need to be involved in local church. You don't need to be a perpetual visitor. You need to be connected, not just associated with. Connect with us, other spirit-filled Christians and get involved in local church that's preaching the Word of God. Get involved. And finally, finally, this is the real finally. That was part of the finally. We have not, and you know we have not exhausted this subject. We've only begun. We're not done teaching it, and we're not done living it. We must never stop learning, never stop studying, and never stop applying. For if we do, we'll stop winning. You can't stop. We are not ignorant of his devices, the Bible says, or his schemes or his methods. We're aware that we have an enemy, and he never sleeps, he never slumbers, and he doesn't get tired. In fact, he is motivated by rage to come after you. Lest you think we're going off the deep end, let me say two things first of all. If I'm going to jump in somewhere, I'm going to jump in the deep end. You jump in the shallow end, you happen to dive in shallow end, you might get your neck broke and get paralyzed. A lot of Christians are paralyzed because they've been diving in the shallow end. Well, oh, I'm diving in that shallow end. I'm diving in. You, you need to get in the deep end. Get on out in the deeper water where faith leads you, where faith sustains you. Get out in there where it takes faith in God to be able to exist. Get out there. We're not 
over-exaggerating, but lest you think we are, Lest you think we're playing the part of a fatalist and saying, oh, man, you're, you got to do this, you're going to do it wrong. Let me show you what I'm talking about. See, Satan is out to get you. I said that earlier, right? He's not just out to get you. He's out to get your children. He's out to get your children or he's out to get you children. And he's out to get you. And he does not have any favorites. He does not say any are outside his realm. He does not say, well, we won't mess with them because they're just kids. You go to Amazon, Walmart, Books a Million, Barnes and Nobles, and many others listed that I didn't send to write down. And there's a book out called A Children's Book of Demons. And there's the cover of it. A Children's Book of Demons. And it's for ages three and up. Just leave the picture up there if you want to. It's written by Aaron Layton. And it says this, you don't want to take the trash out tonight? Maybe you're swimming in homework. Perhaps that big bully's being really a drag. Well, grab your colored pencils and seagull drawings and skills and dial up some demons. And what are they going to do when they dial up demons? The purpose is to dial up demons to send them to take care of their business. It is a beginning book in sorcery, a beginning book in casting spells. And it's on sale for all your little kids. And here's what it says about it. This paranormal parody is filled to the brim with funny spirits more silly than scary. Baloney. More, they're scary. They parade as angels of light. They parade as silly little spirits. But there's no such thing as a silly little demon. Every one of them has either got fangs to inject poison or it's a constrictor to squeeze you and kill you. But they're all serpents. They're all serpents. A seagull, is it, I looked it up because I didn't know what that was. I'm one of the smartest people you know. <laughs> really, I have this. <laughs> I didn't say I was intelligent. I said I'm smart. I can look up stuff, and I can find stuff that I don't know about. And so I looked it up, and it says a seagull is an inscribed or painted symbol considered to have magical powers. And they're used in incantations or used in casting spells. They draw them up and I don't know how to do it. I'm not going to investigate any further probably. So lest you think we're just firing a bunch of shots over the bow to warn people and scare people, we're not doing it. It's real. The war is real. And you're engaged in it. And there ain't nothing you can do to get out of it except die. If you're a Christian, you'll go to heaven. If you're not a Christian, you're going to go live with them for the rest of eternity. So thy word to you is be sure you're a Christian. Be sure Jesus Christ is your Savior. Don't say you're a Christian because you go to church. Don't say you're a Christian because your mom and dad were Christians. Don't say you're a Christian because your granddad started a church somewhere. Don't say you're a Christian because you gave some money to a church. Don't say you're a Christian because you're not a Catholic or a Jew. You're a Christian if you have Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you know Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. If you don't know him, you don't. That's very, very simple. Nothing hard about it. But if I don't know Jesus Christ, what do I do? Introduce him to yourself. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. You died on the cross for my sin. And I ask you now to forgive me. To come to my life, be my Savior. I put my trust in you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? To think eternity is based on that simple little prayer. If you've never done that, you need to do it today. Either right there where you're sitting or come down to the front and let us pray it with you. You need to do that. Don't play Russian roulette with eternity. Well, I may do it next week or next time. Next week or next time may not come. 